In the devastated landscape of the First World War, a few places became infamous for the sheer scale of death and destruction that occurred there. One of these is a small hill in the middle of the Ypres salient. Here, over four years of war, ownership of the hill became a bloody seesaw as both sides wrestled for control of this vital patch of ground. When the fighting above ground became too much to bear, both sides began tunnelling deep below the earth and blasted each other's trenches with explosive charges larger than anything that had ever been seen. Today, the tortured landscape has been preserved as a tribute to the armies who fought here and the thousands of men who still lie beneath the torn earth. This is Hill 60. We're obviously in the centre of churned up ground. The, the ground's been preserved as it was during the Great War. I know there was a lot of mining activity in this area. This is the, we're seeing evidence of that now, aren't we? Just here in the, in the woods on our left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is Hill 60. And in uh, 1915, they dug the first mines underground here, several meters underground, blew up the German fortifications, but it didn't lead to great significant ground gain. And so they had to rethink the whole plan, you know, and uh, that took quite a while. So in 1917, they, they did the same thing, but a lot bigger, basically. So that's, that's what we're seeing now. So when we see these big holes down in the ground just beside us, these are the mines. These are the craters that were left by these huge underground yep, explosions. Yep, yep. Dug sometimes three, four hundred metres long by clay kickers. Uh, blokes from, you know, the UK, but also Australia, New Zealand, Canada, who, uh, who dug in, in these life-threatening conditions, you know. Um, underground made a big room, you know, the size of a good container. Stuff it full of ammo and gun cotton and other things and then, you know, blow it up at the right time. It's a pretty extraordinary type of warfare. And I mean, I think it's fantastic that that not just the battlefield, but that story has been preserved on this site yes. because around us are the craters, the trenches, smashed pillboxes. What does it mean to a local person that this, that this sector of the battlefield has been preserved? It means a lot. It, uh, it is a place that doesn't need an awful lot of stories. It, it is a battlefield, but it's also, if you think of it, it's a mouse grave. How many soldiers would still be here today? It is, uh, it's very special. And I remember, you know, I grew up next to this. Uh, I came here an awful lot as a, as a young lad. And uh, it's the remembrance you see, you know, the people visiting that, that really brought it home to me. And that's how I started to think about it and how I got into doing this as well. You know, it is uh, seeing other school children, other adults come around the battlefields uh, and, and finding this place incredibly emotional. That, uh, that triggered me to, to learn more about it, yes. And what does it mean to the local people that Australians and British people and New Zealanders and Canadians and some Germans are still coming over to walk this ground? Is there still relevance a century after the fighting died down? An awful lot of Belgians find it often mind-blowing that people would travel all the way from you know, Australia to come and see a bloke's grave whom they've never met, you know, uh, who died a hundred years ago. But if you come to think of it, why people go to, through such lengths to come over on these trips, you know, um, it, it really proves um, the importance of it. And for us, it's, it's, uh, it's a symbol uh, not of, well, of peace, you know, it's why this should never ever happen again. You know, that's what the, the Belgians often, how the Belgians often look at this, yes. Well, it's a good point. Let's keep going and looking at some more of Hill 60. Yeah, yeah, yes. Simon, we're actually standing on, well, the smashed remains of a German blockhouse or pillbox. And there's one over there. There's, there's several scattered around here. So this, this shows this wasn't behind the lines. I mean, that's fairly obvious with the, with the rolling ground, but the Germans were fortifying here. And this is really why there was so much activity in this spot, isn't it? Yeah. Because this is a, a dominant place on the battlefields. Yeah, the Germans put in line several lines of defense, concrete bunkers, sometimes every 50 meters they had them. Uh, a reinforced concrete, a meter thick. And you can see on the roof we're standing on, it's, it's not dense by the artillery. 
Uh, so the only way really to, to tackle these pillboxes was blowing them up from underneath. That was the one way that worked best. There is a place nearby here uh, that uh, where four, the story goes, four Germans were found sitting around the table playing cards, dead by concussion because of the mine that had blown up. They were just tossed around in these very small confined spaces. Um, you know, and um, there's another bunker that was just tossed in the air a few meters and then flew on its backside. So these mines, you know, several tons of ammo were so incredibly powerful, so much more powerful than, than any piece of artillery. Well, it's incredible that these are still left. I mean, let's go down and have a, a bit of a closer look yep. down here. I mean, you can, the thing I love about this, Simon, is this is genuine history now. You can see that there's, a t there's an opening there to the yep. pillbox that it's smashed on the front where artillery's hit it. You can see how German soldiers would have come down here and sheltered in here. And when you imagine the walls are probably several feet thick, there's not a lot of space inside. So it's items like this that just demonstrate the, the horror of the First World War, the cramped conditions, the, the exposure, to, exposure to shell fire. It's just, this is why it's so important to have these tangible links with history, isn't it? It is, it is. It brings it home so much more. This is a feeling, something you can't understand without you know you have to stand here to, to see it to experience it to 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 get an inkling of how it must have been you know and so the germans would, wouldn't man their front line very much you know you'd only have a handful of, of lads to man the machine guns who could shelter in these few bunkers because there's no space hardly inside of them so uh, but still you know uh, being in there safe but having the artillery raining down up you, on you constantly, mentally, it must have been, you know, it must have been excruciating for them, you know, uh, not being, you know, not knowing when would, the one would come that would be your, you know, be your last. Well, this this is an interesting one too because it tells quite a story in a number of ways to me as well. Firstly, the concrete is incredibly rough. This is very poor concrete with you know yeah, whatever yeah, aggregate yeah, they could find put in and there's an obvious reason for that yeah, we're yeah. right in the front line this was constructed in the front line at dark work yeah, parties would yeah. come up pour the concrete and build this thing overnight with inside of the enemy yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just incredible but also when we think of pillboxes we think probably more of the sort of saving private ryan world war ii variety where there's a big loophole in the front yeah, yeah, and machine yeah, yeah, guns yeah, yeah. blasting out but this is much more typical isn't it Yes. It's really just just a shelter. It's just a just, place yeah. for men yeah. to escape the barrage. Yeah. And then when it was time to fight, they'd come out and set up their exactly. weapons exactly. on can, either side. You can still see how it was made. You know, you can still see the lines in it. They poured one level of concrete after another until it was strong enough, if you like. So this was indeed done at night. And, and, and you can also see in a lot of the bunkers that, um, you know, Germany was very, uh, well, was blockaded. So they had a lack of anything, basically. So the longer the war lasted, the poorer the construction materials became. But still, you know, it's proof of German ingenuity, engineering that a hundred years on, these still stand, you know. And uh, I know people who've tried to remove some in the old days and uh, it's, it's almost impossible. You know, they're so incredibly strong and, you know, still a hundred years on, yeah. Simon, this must be one of the most photographed bunkers on the entire Western Front. It's an extraordinary structure. Now, this was originally German, wasn't it? And then taken over by the British. Yes, yes. So the Germans, as part of their defenses on Hill 60, built various blockhouses here. And they were very strong, you know, even after the mine explosion, even after the British captured, captured them, uh, they were impregnable. And uh, they uh, used it as the basis to rebuild another bunker on top of it. The ground here was so soggy, you know. So what we see here is the what we see here is the British bunker built on top of the, the German one. Well, I think they called it turned around, where turned they took around. a they took a, a, a German bunker and they turned it around and built this this British one on top of it. And you can see the lighter concrete uh, reveals that it's a British construction from after the fighting here in 1917. I think from about 1918 yep. they they did this to defend when the Germans were pushing back. Uh, through this area, but do you know the story of this in 1940? It has no. a Second World War connection, no, which is I'm actually really quite, it's fascinating and tragic. In 1940, when the, the British Expeditionary Force arrived in the Second World War, and the Germans were sweeping through this area again, the old battlefields were being fought over mm. yet again, they repurposed this and put it into service. And 
Vickers gun crews were based in here to try and stop the Germans. And so they were based in here again. They, they refronted this, they would have put timber reveting around the, around the loopholes. And, and British machine gun crews were here again to try and stop the Germans. And they did very effectively stop the Germans who were advancing from this direction. And this pillbox held up the German advance for quite a long time. And the only way the Germans eventually got through was just over in this area, they set up an anti-tank gun which okay. was firing, you can see it was firing in this direction. So okay, out of the yes, range of the, out yeah. of the range of the machine guns, it was firing from this direction and sadly eventually it was overrun and all of the British defenders here were killed in this uh, wow. in yeah, this action. Yeah, so yeah. they fought to yeah. the end right here. But you can see where the explosions have come in and, and smashed the concrete and taken these huge chunks out and bent the metal. Uh, there's one very clear indication that there was an anti-tank gun firing on this position, is that one of the rounds is still embedded in the concrete. So I think it's just a very, um, it's a tragic spot. Wow. I mean, the, the, men, the men here fighting to the last in 1940. It's an incredible link with two world wars. Yeah, yeah. And so, Trying to keep the gap in Dunkirk open as long as possible, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. So it's a place I always like to come and, and think about that chapter of the war as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. There's a, an awful lot of those lads from 1940 buried at Bedford House just around the corner here. So uh, yeah, perhaps some of them were here in this, uh, this very bunker. This is it, the Hill 60 crater. Everyone's heard about this. They've seen the movie Beneath Hill 60. Here we are in the bottom of the crater. And it's, it's, it always strikes me as odd, this one, because it doesn't look like a crater because it effectively blew the whole side of the hill out, yeah, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a railway embankment on the other side, so a lot of the blasts went that way. And that's why it doesn't appear as big as some of the other craters, perhaps. But, uh, you know, it is, uh, it, you know, it would have been a horrific place. You have to imagine that this was a hill, you know, we're standing in, in the bottom. It wouldn't have been flat. It would have been higher still, you know, the top. So the amount of soil that was blasted out created the rim around it is just gigantic. You know, uh, they recently had to work on the track, so Belgian bomb disposal came in to demine some of that area. And they found, you know, I think about 150 shells still around the railway embankment, you know. Uh, uh, for a stretch of not even 100 meters they, they were looking for, you know, looking at. So it was, uh, it, it is, it is, yeah. <laughs> It was incredibly hard fought over and uh, it still is a relic from those days, yeah. It's hard to believe, Simon, when we stand here looking around. It's so tranquil. There's birds in the trees, the sun's coming through, beautiful mist. I mean, this is gorgeous countryside. But then you think about what this was like for four years, only a century ago. It, it, you can't do it, can you? You can't make no, the leap no. of imagination, even in a place that's been preserved like this. No, I, I don't think that's the point. I don't think we should try. You can't imagine what it would have been. It would have been horrific. I think if you've served in war, you might have an inkling. You might understand it better. But still, the, at various places, the front line moved sometimes over the course of months or years. At this place, it roughly stayed the same for most of the First World War. It was always, you know, the same square kilometer roughly that was uh, in the center of the Ypres salient and the Messine salient is where the two, the two half circles meet, basically. Well, that's the reason it's been preserved, isn't it? Because this site was purchased by veterans immediately after the First World War. They felt it was so significant. They wanted to preserve it for future generations so that people who hadn't been involved in the war could come and see just what it would have been like. Yeah, true, true. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission is still in advisory capacity involved in this place as well today. So the, the veterans back then came, put up memorials, for instance. Uh, you could go in the tunnels in those old days still, which was quite dangerous, I'm sure. You could see the trenches and it, uh, the, it was even a small museum at the top of the road back then in those days. Uh, but still today it's very important that we keep sites because although we can't imagine what it would have been, this place gives us some kind of an idea what they would have gone through. And uh, as I said before, it is, it is kind of a mass grave, you know, the, the amount of German soldiers blown up exactly where we're standing, you know, this, this site should be kept, yes. Simon, now this is what you expect when you talk about a mine crater. This is pretty, it's always pretty impressive. The caterpillar 
This is just next to Hill 60 and wow, I mean, this gives Gigantic. a great visual indication of what that would have been like, that explosion that, that came up and just devastated the German lines in this sector. It's a remarkable spot. It earthquake the ridge, you know, it is, it's incredibly impressive today. It's gigantic, you know, it's about 30 tons of amyl in one split second going up, you know. If you were on top of this hill that would have been here, you, well, there's nothing left, let's say. Well, you were saying that there's been research done indicating that probably not as many Germans as we originally thought were killed here. I've heard reports of 20,000, yeah. 10,000 at least. But you, there's, there's research that suggests that's not quite, not quite the case. No, no, no. So the Germans we, know, we now know only uh, garrisoned the front line very uh, thinly. Only the machine gun nests were manned, really, let's say. And also, if you look, the, look at, do the math, you know, you look at this terrain, there were 19 craters like this. Uh, you couldn't physically fit 10,000 people on them, you know, almost, or they'd be shoulder to shoulder. So uh, the estimates are around 1,800 to 1,000, perhaps, that would have died uh, as a direct result of these explosions. It includes several of the tunnels, possibly below ground as well, you know. That's still um, an awful lot of it's, people. It's still You're talking 800 or 1,000 yeah. people. That's a lot of people. Uh, what had perhaps far more of an influence is, um, is the mental effect this had. You know, on, on the battle itself, you know, uh, the thousands of Germans waiting in the support lines, it would have been devastating for them as well. A lot of dead channels and trenches in the back area would collapse because of the earthquake as well. And uh, the barrage... 2,500 pieces of artillery firing all in the same minute, coming raining down on this line. That would have created a hell of a lot more casualties potentially than the the mines by themselves. Yeah. Well, until you know, until we saw atomic bombs in the Second World War and this sort of thing, this was the largest explosion. It's a bit of a weird statistic, but it's mm. the largest man-made yes, explosion it was. Uh, anywhere in the world. So yep. this was. Yep. I, I, I can't quite imagine what it would have been like for those German soldiers to see the rippling effect of these huge mines. 19 huge mines going up just like this one. It would have been yes. terrifying. It would have been terrifying if you, if you read the eyewitness accounts from both sides. It is, uh, it's, it's horrowing, you know. Uh, it, huge pillars of flame shooting hundreds of uh, meters into the air. It took quite a while for all the dust and, and the pieces of earth to settle again to fall from the sky and you have to know this was done just before first light it have been happening in complete darkness that again would have magnified the the, the visual effect it had and um, knowing that the same minute you have this this rain you know of fire coming down upon you from the artillery the barrage starting and then thousands of Aussies, you know, Brits, Kiwis, Irish <laughs> running up these hills. Uh, it went very fast, you know, within a few hours they would have reached all of their objectives and the, the battle was not over, it lasted another week, but let's say the objectives were all reached um, on time and that was unheard of in the First World War. This was one of the first large Allied successes in the First World War and that um, that by itself was was so significant that still today an awful lot of the British recruits from the army come here to learn about the tactics used a hundred years ago and, and try and look at it how they would implement them today you know if you have to do this today how would you look at it so that that by itself shows its significance you know planning General Plumer was a planner and it proved you know it worked looking ahead you know doing doing the numbers on this led to a success for the Allies and sadly to a horrific loss of life on both sides still, yeah. We've been talking a lot about the underground war, the tunnelers, the miners who dug these hugely long shafts and then planted explosives and blew up these huge mines beneath the Germans during the Battle of Messines in 1917. But what a wonderful testament we have to them here. Actually a memorial to the tunnelers, the Australian tunnelers who were here in June 1917. Just extraordinary. You don't see too many memorials to tunnelers on the battlefields. No, you certainly don't, no. And uh, I just wonder in Australia, where do you know where these guys came from? What did they do in normal life? How, how do you recruit someone to for such a dangerous job? Well, they were miners. They were, they were gold miners or coal miners and they came from all over, but particularly those mining areas uh, in, the, in the bush. Uh, and they were recruited specifically to come and work in these tunnels. But obviously it's a big departure 
from working in a, in a gold mine or a coal mine in, in Australia to coming over here in these cramped, muddy conditions laying these, these mines. And incredibly dangerous work yeah. as well. No one back home in Australia would be ready to blow you up, you know. <laughs> That's was, a good uh, point. Yeah, there's lots of hand-to-hand -hand fighting going on underground. These tunnels 30, 40 meters below ground, you know, 400 meters long. Gigantic galleries, you know, with just a candle or a small lantern. Must have been pretty scary for them to, to do stuff like this, you know. Well, this is a, a monument to the Australians, but we should also remember that there were tunnelers from just about every nation that contributed. So Canadians did a lot yep. of work around here. British, of course, we should never forget the British. New Zealanders, just about every country contributed miners to the whole thing. Um, True. But I'm also noting that this was an area that was fought over again in the Second World War because we've actually got bullet holes. Yeah in the monument yeah so i mean what as a, as a belgian simon you live in this area you grew up in this area how, how does it make you feel knowing that only 20 or 25 years after this all died down all this horror had died down it was all back again as evidenced by this uh, the, yeah. this damage on the memorial it was uh, mind-blowing for the local people for uh, for a lot of british people as well for a lot of veterans people for very long trying to resist it try to prevent it from happening again but you know in the end you, you it was out of our hands, you know, you couldn't, you know, if Mr. Hitler decided to invade us again, let, let's have it all again. And, um, you know, it was, um, it was very tough, especially on the people who had gone through it before. It really was uh, harrowing. But also, the, despite all that, they were very bold, they were very, um, uh, they resisted, you know, they wouldn't give way and they uh, always hoped that better days would be around the corner you know and eventually we were liberated again but this place as you said is a silent reminder of, of world war ii as well it's one of the few places where a memorial was actually blown up as well you know and not this particular one but another one close by was blown up by the germans in the second world war as, as to have some fun basically you know uh, it's just uh sickening you know you go through it once you have to go through it again so that's you know why why this is very much peace building for us as well these trips you know it's showing people around the world what it is like and hopefully you know not having to live through it again we uh everyone here in this area is the son grandson great grandson of a refugee everyone we've all been refugees at one point or another it's flanders it's belgium you know it is it's actually been fought over for centuries so there's you know my father always says we're the third generation in our family who've grown up without having a war on our doorstep you know, we can trace our family a thousand years in this city. So that's, that says something. Let's hope it stays that way.